When I ask you, what is the most misunderstood film of all time, you could give me a million answers. Donnie Darko, The Wolf of Wall Street, American Psycho, I could go on. These are all movies whose plots, characters, and themes are commonly misunderstood for one reason or another. But generally speaking, it's just one of the aforementioned elements that causes the confusion. Really, the only example that I know of, of an audience not getting all three concepts, would have to be the 2009 high school horror comedy, Jennifer's Body. Because after all this time, we're finally far enough removed from the controversy and mismanagement by the team behind the film's promotion that the movie actually found the audience that it always deserved. It's just a decade too late. Ironically, I'd argue that this resurgence in popularity has only fueled the discourse surrounding it. Now, a whole new generation of people are arguing over themes and story beats that they honestly don't seem to fully understand. So, being the pretentious film bro that I am, I decided to take a crack at it and explain why I believe Jennifer's Body to be the most misunderstood film of all time. For those who haven't watched the movie or just need a refresher, here's a quick plot summary. The film opens by introducing us to this blonde girl narrating from within a solitary confinement cell at a psych ward. I could fix her. This is Needy, whose name is a little on the nose, I know, but just go with it. She gives us the cliche, Erm, you're probably wondering how I got in this situation that every early 2000s film did, but she's in solitary, so it's a little bit different. And that's really an excellent way to get us accustomed to the tone that this film is going for. It's just like any other high school comedy, just with demons, Satan worship, and succubi. Anyway, Needy quickly introduces us to the titular woman herself, Jennifer, played by Megan Fox. Jennifer is your average bitchy popular girl type. Interestingly though, her and Needy, who's the weird girl, you can tell because she wears glasses, are best friends. They've known each other since sandbox days, and as the film says, sandbox love never dies. This dynamic is what most of the movie is actually about. Jennifer's body isn't a revenge story, it's not a sexy teen flick, and it's not some grand attack on the patriarchy. At its core, Jennifer's body is very simply the exploration of toxic relationships between young women. Anyway, skipping to the inciting incident of the film, Needy and Jennifer go to a bar to see this local band perform. Jen takes the opportunity to hit on the lead singer, who seemingly intends to take advantage of her. As Needy goes to confront the band, however, the bar begins to burn down, and several people inside die. Jen and Needy barely escape, but when they do, the band convinces Jennifer to leave with them instead of Needy, who obviously protests her leaving. And this is where the horror elements finally come in. See, the band is under the impression that Jennifer's a virgin, and to get famous, they struck up a pact with the devil wherein he will make them famous so long as they sacrifice a virgin to him. There's just one problem though. Evidently, Jennifer isn't a virgin, so when they perform the sacrifice, dire consequences follow. The band does end up becoming famous, but Jennifer faces repercussions for their actions as she becomes an undead monster who must feed on the living to survive. She spends the remainder of the film acting as a succubus, luring men to sleep with her before murdering them for her own survival. The thing is though, her victims are all good people. None of them really deserve what happens to them. The only thing that actually connects Jennifer's victims is Needy's positive opinions of them, and therefore Jen's jealousy. The movie ends when Jennifer attacks Needy's boyfriend. Needy is able to save him in the end after a fight with Jennifer, but after she escapes, Needy tracks Jennifer down, sneaks in through her window, and kills her. However, she gets caught red-handed after the slaughter, and that's how she ends up where the movie began. Okay, so now that we've gotten that out of the way, I can confidently say that this film is the perfect storm of horrible elements that led to the confusion and misunderstanding. That's not to say that the movie itself is bad, however, just let me explain. Firstly, let's get the obvious out of the way. This movie is a textbook case for how bad marketing can cannibalize the sales of a product. In 2009, actress Megan Fox was at the center of public consciousness. She was best known for her role as Michaela Baines in Michael Bay's hit Transformers. For Fox, this role was both a blessing and a curse. She earned her fame for sure, but she was also heavily sexualized and seen primarily for her body and not her abilities as an actress. So, two years later, when Jennifer's body was prepping for release, the marketing team tried to capitalize on this perceived image of her. I'm not exaggerating when I say that every shot of the trailer is Megan either nude or undressing. 
and every soundbite comes from her saying something that could be seen as provocative. Hell, this side character has more screen time in the teaser than the actual main character. That alone should be demonstrative of how poor this trailer is at advertising the film. As mentioned earlier, this movie is one made by and for young women. That's not to say that people outside of that demographic can't also enjoy it. If that was the case, I wouldn't be making this video right now. But, to put it simply, the audience who came to see Megan take her top off were quite disappointed when the film they got ended up being about two girls and their complicated friendship and feelings for one another. As a result of exposing this film to the wrong audience, negative reviews and less than ideal word of mouth spread, leading to a box office result of only $31.6 million worldwide. Against a budget of $16 million, as well as estimated production costs, that means that Jennifer's body just managed to break even without much of a splash. And that's where it kinda sat for a while. Thought of only as a forgettable movie, marketed as something it was never meant to be, that people didn't really care for. But, like I touched on in the intro, it's had a huge resurgence. After a few years of steadily gaining popularity, it completely blew up in 2021. 12 years after its original release. The reasoning behind this is pretty simple, actually. That's just how long it took for enough people to take a chance on it and spread word that, hey, this is actually pretty good. But every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So all of the sudden love for this film didn't come without its fair share of adversity and criticism. However, a lot of the common critiques given to the movie, in my eyes, aren't really valid. I'm not one to really rag on others' opinions, except for you people. But so much of the hate for this movie in the modern era comes from a genuine lack of understanding of what Jennifer's body was going for. Namely, the characters and their motivations. This movie is constantly referred to as confused. People think it's trying to be and say too much all at once. And the number one element that people point to to illustrate this argument is Jennifer and her motivations. And to tackle this, I'd like to introduce you to this guy. Evil Kopi. We'll call him, uh... Uh, Abaddon. Named after the Angel of the Abyss. That's actually pretty fitting for bad internet opinions. He's gonna be representing those common opposing arguments that I've been alluding to throughout the video. Go ahead, Abaddon. Look, this movie is just way too overcrowded. They try to do so much, yet end up not following through on any of it. Like with Jennifer. In the beginning, we get the vibe that despite her apparent popularity, she's jealous of Needy. So it looks like the movie's going that way before she gets kidnapped by the band. Then suddenly she's this vengeful monster who wants to get back at all men and the patriarchy. But then they forget that plot element too, and suddenly she's just in love with Needy? And then, okay, I'm gonna cut you off there. Jennifer is by all means a static character. If you don't like that, that's fine, but saying her motivations and personality change is just untrue. At the beginning of the film, it is made incredibly obvious that she and Needy have a complicated relationship. Jennifer is mean to her, like a schoolboy pulling the hair of the girl he likes. When their feelings for each other are revealed, it's not at all surprising. Hell, they practically beat you over the head with it at the beginning of the film. And because of those feelings, Jennifer is not jealous of Needy, she's jealous of those around Needy. She's rude to and even tries to kill her boyfriend. She has absolutely no interest in the emo boy until Needy mentions that she likes him, and despite being the most convenient person for her to feast upon, Jen refuses to kill Needy. If she was truly jealous of her, and not just those around her, that would not be the case. Okay, well what about the band? They take advantage of, kidnap, and murder her. Yet, she takes it out on the men around Needy, of all people? She never even makes an attempt to kill the band members off. And that's intentional. After the incident with the band, nothing about Jennifer changes other than physically. She targets the men around Needy not because she hates all men or wants revenge or anything like that, but because she wants to be the only person in Needy's life. Again, this movie is about the complicated and toxic relationship between these two girls. Bringing in a revenge element would just distract from the intent. Also, I want to say that I think it is very much on purpose that the band doesn't go away after their time in the plot is served. They become famous, they're everywhere, and completely inescapable. And that's not done to remind the audience of Jennifer's anger or motivation. 
It's to depict the complicated realities behind what that scene actually represents. Look, I don't have to explain what this scene is allegorical for. A group of bad men did something terrible to Jennifer's body without her consent when she was still a young girl with her whole life ahead of her. And this depiction of the immediate aftermath is so much more true to life than her getting her powers and then defeating them. Because without getting on my soapbox too much here, the sad truth is that sex crime is not adequately prosecuted and is very rarely even reported as many young women are pressured into silence. The band being everywhere is completely intentional. No, that event doesn't dictate all of Jen's actions or personality going forward, but they are ever-present. Many victims are not taken advantage of by strangers, and after attacks, they'll still see them at work, school, or even home. Even when legal action is taken, it's often years before justice is served. And even then, we have some light sentences and precedents for these acts, for ruining a life. The fact is, in the shoes of someone like Jennifer, her assailants will never truly go away. And this is how the film chose to present that, which I find to be one of its best qualities despite the constant scrutiny. People constantly mistake these character motivations, particularly for Jennifer, for things that they're simply not. Jen's infatuation with Needy is and always was driving her actions. Needy, on the other hand, is a much more rounded character. Although, her arc from Shy Girl to Vengeful Demon is one that's more common in film and therefore less confusing to people online from what I've seen. Something that does still confuse people, however, is the final of our three topics, the theme and message. So, what is it that this movie is trying to get across specifically? Sure, it has themes of friendship, coming of age, codependency, and many more, but What's the thesis? Well, despite the many answers you'll find to this question online, I really don't think it's that negotiable. Of course, everyone is entitled to their own interpretations of art, but in terms of the thesis, there's only one real option. It's actually the very first line spoken in the film. Hell is a teenage girl. Or rather, hell is being a teenage girl. Every single plot element, character interaction, and arc clearly serves this one single statement. Writer and director Diablo Cody not only made this film for teenage girls, but about teenage girls. And it covers everything, from high school drama to finding out who you are, to the unfortunate side of being a woman, and so much more. Which is why the marketing fumble is so much more upsetting. The initial backlash did a huge disservice to a great movie that can really help those facing the struggles of growing up to feel both heard and not alone. This is a complicated film that's hard to understand for those outside of its target demographic, or people like me who spend all their time thinking about movies. It's a movie that has so much to say, but was robbed of the platform that it could have had to use its voice. An incredibly poetically ironic situation for a movie with this subject matter to fall into. And that's why, in my opinion, Jennifer's Body is the most misunderstood film of all time. Okay, really quick before you go, I'm trying to hit 1,000 subscribers before my birthday on July 27th. So, if you enjoyed this video, it would mean the absolute most for you to subscribe and help me reach that milestone. Thanks so much, as always, to my channel members listed on the right, Alan Smith and JBS. I really couldn't do it without you guys. And lastly, if you're not quite sure if you want to subscribe yet, you can click the monitor to check out my dissection of Immaculate and how it relates to religious trauma. Well, that just about covers everything. So one more time, thank you so much for watching, and please remember, believe to achieve.